So I went out and collected all of the historical data, price per share changes, dividends earned for every single one of the current dividend aristocrats and dividend kings for the past 10 years and compared the results against the S&P 500. And here's what I found. What's up you guys, welcome back to the Average Joe Investor channel. We talk a lot about dividend stocks with a particular emphasis on high quality dividend stocks. And there's no better definition for high quality dividend stocks than when we talk about dividend aristocrats and dividend kings meaning stocks that have been paying and increasing their dividend now for 25 to 50 plus consecutive years. But one thing we often don't talk about is how do these stocks perform against the S&P 500 on a total return basis? And I thought to myself, we should get the actual data to see which are the right stocks to use. And as you can see, there's quite a spread between the top performing stocks here and the lowest performing stocks. As a reminder, this spreadsheet and all of the other spreadsheets that I use, as as well as my own dividend portfolio, all the trades that I make in my portfolio, all of this can be yours. All of this, you can have access to all of this by joining the Patreon community, which also gives you access to the amazing Discord community. If you wanna learn more about how to do that, check out the link down in the description below. The assumptions we built in here that we're gonna look at on a deeper level is if we started back 10 years ago, at the beginning of November 2013, and we invested $100,000 into each of these individual dividend stocks and also to the S&P 500, we reinvested all dividends but did not contribute any additional money along the way, which of these stocks had the highest total returns compared to the S&P 500? Or did it make this the most sense to just use the S&P 500? Now, before we look at the individual results here, it's important to remember that past performance has no impact on future results. These stocks, could continue to outperform the S&P 500, the ones that did, and they could also completely tank and the ones that were previously underperforming could overperform. We just don't know what the future holds. We're just looking at historical data to see which stocks have outperformed the S&P 500. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look down into the details and see which stocks drastically underperformed and which of them drastically overperformed. Now you can see here that we had a total stock, total number of stocks we were looking at here was a total of 34 stocks. And you'll notice that I broke out the number of shares owned at the beginning of the period and at the end. And I'll explain more about that in just a second. But you'll notice that the number of stocks that actually outperform the S&P 500 based on total return is actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them. 12 outperformed on a total return basis, which means there were 21 stocks that underperformed the S&P 500. Though you can see there were a few here that were relatively close based on overall balance. Let's take a look here real quick. First off at the underperforming stocks. They were Walmart Incorporated, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, Archer Daniels Midland, Target Corporation, Johnson & Johnson, Cardinal Health, Altria Group, Coca-Cola, Chevron, Exxon Mobil, Hormel Foods, Emerson Electric, Clorox, T. Rowe Price, Kimberly Clark Corporation, PPG Industries, Medtronic, International Business Machines, or IBM, 3M Company, and Walgreens Boots Alliance. Remember, all of these stocks started with $100,000 invested back in November of 2013, all dividends reinvested during the past 10 years. This is where we landed. And you can see, man, 3M and Walgreens have drastically underperformed the rest of the stocks. Some of them were much closer to the S&P 500, like Walmart, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, but a lot of them drastically underperformed the S&P 500. Here are the stocks that outperform the S&P 500. First off, Aflac Incorporated, ticker symbol AFL, had 302,000 compared to 283 for the S&P 500, SPY. Then we had Abbott Laboratories, ABT. We had NextEra Energy, NEE. General Dynamics, GD. McDonald's Corporation, MCD. Nucor Corporation, NUE. Lind Public Limited Company, LIN, Caterpillar, CAT, Automatic Data Processing, or ADP, ABV, ABBV, Lowe's Companies, LOW, and lastly, S&P Global, SPGI. Here's a look graphically of these stocks over this time. The big fat white line, it's kind of hard to see, but it's right here in the middle. This is the S&P 500 right through here. And we had, like I said, quite a few stocks that outperformed significantly. The primary one being right here, SP, SB Global, which drastically outperformed the other two. And you can see down here, the really low performing stocks like Walgreens Boots Alliance. Then we've also got 
MMM or 3M, and then IBM down here as well. Now, one thing I did look at here was the change in shares owned. Remember, we were reinvesting dividends all along the way here. So when dividends were reinvested, more shares were purchased. So this shows the change in overall shares owned from start to finish. Why is this important? It's important within the context of covered calls. Remember, every one covered call contract requires at least 100 shares owned. So the fact that you can increase your shares does impact how many contracts you can write for covered calls. You'll notice if you sort by percentage increase in the shares, meaning the largest difference between the ending amount of shares versus the beginning amount of shares is significant. We've got Altria Group and International Business Machines, or IBM here, at 81% increase and a 78% increase. This is not at all correlated with the performance of the price per share necessarily. What you'll generally see when we look at these percentage increase in shares is that the stocks that didn't move as much had larger increases in the amount of shares that they owned because those shares were purchased every time a dividend was earned and they were done so at lower prices. The stocks that shot up, like S&P Global, for example, had a very low percentage of, of shares increase right here, only 11%. Now, I don't think anyone's complaining about the fact that they started with $100,000 and they ended with 541, that's not the point here. But some of these stocks here, uh, like Altria Group, IBM, ExxonMobil, Chevron, AbV, significant increases in the amount of shares just from reinvesting dividends. And the truth is, if we had also been writing covered calls along the way, this would likely, not guaranteed, but likely transit into many more contracts being able to sell for the covered calls and could potentially have a great impact on the overall final balance as well as the amount of income earned. What we can take away is over the past 10 years, it made a lot of sense to just own the S&P 500 rather than try to pick the best dividend stocks. Because we have no idea if these stocks here, the ones that outperform the S&P 500, are going to continue to outperform the S&P 500 in the future. We have no idea. Another thing to factor in here as well is these dividend stocks here that did outperform the S&P 500 over the past 10 years on a total return basis, a lot of them would be a little bit restrictive when it comes to writing covered calls. I mean, for example, you need $8,000 right now to buy 100 shares of Aflac. You need 10,000 for Abbott. $5,700 for Nextera, $24,000, $28,000, $15,000, $41,000, $24,000, $23,000, $13,000, and $41,000. Significant amount of capital necessary in order to write covered calls right now. And honestly, you could make a case that stocks like AbV may not perform as well in the future because their business structure has changed. They don't have the exclusivity with, with certain drugs that they sell, and that could have an impact on future performance. But these stocks here, these are the ones that have outperformed the S&P 500 on a total return basis for the past 10 years. These might be a great list of stocks to start looking at if you prefer to own individual dividend stocks and you're looking for quality dividend stocks with staying power when it comes to their dividend. Hopefully you found some value in this video. Make sure to leave your two cents down on the comments below. It's my goal to respond to all comments left on the day I post a new video. That's all I got for you guys. Have a great rest of your day and thanks for watching.